Hey, readers and writers, I'm Adrian Buskey, and you're watching Fictitious, a show about the storytelling craft of science fiction and fantasy. I'm joining this episode by Eugen Bacon, author of The Road to Whoop Whoop and other stories. This collection of speculative short fiction features over 20 tales that blur the line between reality and mythology, full of humans possessed of unusual gifts, immortals shackled with ageless curses, children born of dangerous secrets, and lovers whose tangled passions spiral to dream and dread. In a nursery rhyme, a mother must face a tragedy in her household, born of a darkness and grief she was never allowed to feel. In a Mahi Mahi chronicle, a wizard from the future visits the Africa of the past to teach his son the most important lessons of magic and inadvertently alters the pattern of history. In a case of seeing, a detective must use her paranormal ability to solve a murder mystery while confronting difficult truths revealed to her by her gift. In Being Marcus, a physical trainer ruminates on his origins in ancient Rome and how a legendary betrayal confined him to an everlasting cycle of longing and loneliness. With lyrical prose and lushly evocative atmospheres, these stories explore grief and healing, love and infidelity, and challenge how we envision our role in relationships and our own futures. The Road to Whoop Whoop weaves magical realism, horror, science fiction, and many shades in between, and it's available now from Meerkat Press. <laughs> And Eugen, welcome to Fictitious. Thank you very much, Adrian. Now, I got to say a, a few things right off here. The book cover was showing earlier in here, but I've, you know, I've got it in front of me if I can get the camera to it. So, um, yeah, exactly. Uh, so uh, when I first learned about this book, I, lear I, I learned of it and you uh, two different ways. One's because the book just showed up in my feed one day and I saw that cover and I was like, oh, I love that. I love that type of graphic design. Um, I love that title. Everything about this is really evocative to me. And then the second thing was that I had other authors who were in my feed, some of who have been on the show before, were talking about doing panels with you and how much they enjoyed speaking with you. And so immediately I was like, well, you're well vetted from uh, people that uh, that I respect. The book sounds really cool. I love short stories, so I'm into this. And I really wanted to check this out. And I have to say, like, there is really, really striking fiction in here. I don't know that I've ever encountered anybody who writes quite like you with a sense of words and voice and uh, just your prose style is very unique. I think short story collections in general are really hard to sum up. And we'll talk about themes that, that reoccur through some of these stories. But I would first want to know, how do you sum up this book? How do you talk about The Road to Whoop Whoop? I'd like to think of it as Whoop Whoop being a no place. And I think the introduction to the book right at the start, I'll just do a quick read of it, which is in the beginning of the page, it just says, she lives out Whoop Whoop, a no place filled with ghosts, random within her grasp, sleeping in a language of desert, a mirage of memory in the middle of nowhere, the back of beyond and loved by the camera who stands a chance. And I feel that this really sums the book in the sense that the stories don't really have to have a specific direction. I'm a very instinctive writer and I usually write, uh, I begin with a skeleton, the skeleton of an idea and the stories shape themselves. And in the beginning, the title of the book was Piney because I really wanted to put together a collection of stories that were about a longing, uh, a yearning for something, the death of something, a dodge, but also a transcendence. And I really wanted to capture the playfulness. And I think some of the stories do this really well. And the reviews of the books tell me that I, I think the ideas came across. So the playfulness is there, but also the dodge and, and the fact that the story doesn't have to go anywhere, but for that moment in time, it transports the reader to a place. Um, right off, I like that, that you did you know read that introduction there, because something that struck me a lot through quite a number of these stories is that they beg to be read out loud. They beg to be performed. There's a sense to me that some of the dialogue feels almost play like, like almost like like a you know theatrical performance. There's a lyricism to it. There's a a meter and a canter to it that to me says that I mean it's designed to be read clearly, but it feels like it was born to be performed. And it was really nice hearing you read that part out loud because I, I feel like that vindicated my own feelings on it and sounded lovely to hear. To 
step back on the the title for a second. Um, I think you kind of hit this a little bit, but can you kind of talk about the significance of it? Because this is a turn of phrase um, that I think is like uh, an Australian turn of phrase, um, not one that we use here. We have our own variations of it. I think it's kind of delightful in its own way, but I'd like to know like uh, what exactly that means and then kind of how that relates. There's, I mean, and there's a, the leadoff story is named the same thing, but how that kind of concept resonates through the whole uh, collection. Yes, so whoop whoop in Australia is very common. You could be talking to somebody and they say, oh, I don't have internet, but that's expected because I live out whoop whoop. And what they mean is that I live so far away that, you know, amenities are not easily available or somebody is traveling and they say, I'm going to whoop whoop. And all you know is that they're going somewhere really far and remote. And this is what I wanted the stories to bring out, like something remote, something almost um, ethereal, something almost amorphous, where you can't really put a finger to it. It's like you're going somewhere, but you don't really know where you're going. And the idea is to immerse yourself into the reading, being open to be astonished, not coming in with any expectation and just reading it story by story. And it doesn't matter which story you begin with. You could start at the beginning, you could start at the end, you could start in the middle, and it will still get you to whoop whoop. And at the end of it, just for you to have that feeling where you're still thinking about the stories because you're still on that journey to whoop whoop. And ideally, when we first started with a collection, the, the title I mentioned previously was a pining, but then I wanted to write some original stories for this collection. And when I wrote this story, The Road to Whoop Whoop, I really resonated with it. It's a story where you have two lovers. The story is about their journey. It doesn't matter where they're going. It's that presence where they are at that moment in time and the disintegration of the relationship manifesting in the physical disintegration of the partner, the man. And when I read the story and I, I showed Trisha, the publisher, she really liked it. And I said, maybe how, how about if the collection was The Road to Whoop Whoop? Because I feel that this, this really captures the essence of the collection. And she was happy with it. And I think it was a very good decision that we made. And then she surprised me because I didn't know that Trisha was going to do the cover. When she asked me about the cover ideas, I said, oh, maybe something Australian, something African. I'm not sure. Just just surprise me. And I thought she'd, you know, farm it out to an artist and come back with ideas. And she put something together and I looked at it and I loved it. And so we, we did very minimal changes. But you can see there's a crock in the cover. You can see there's some skeletons to denote the in, the death and the dodge and just the whole color. There's something African in it. The, also the greens. Yeah, that's that's the story behind Whoop, whoop. Well, definitely a shout out to Trisha then because uh, she did a fantastic job putting that together because it is lovely and it does. It's very evocative. I think like in talking about this collection, I, I guess it's easiest to, to say it's that it's speculative fiction because it covers a really broad range of genres. The stories are definitely, um, you know, kind of range from um, very ethereal to very grounded. The opening story, The Road to Whoop Whoop, starts in in a, a sense of, you know, like you said, it's two lovers in a, in a vehicle having a terse ride where they're trying to communicate with each other and failing to. And then from there, it kind of separates a little bit from a standard reality and gets stranger and weirder and almost, I don't want to call it Twilight Zone-ish, but it does, it like it veers into this sense of is this paranormal is this dream is this just becoming unhinged from reality in ways that allow you to kind of explore thematic relationship emotional things in a completely different way and i find that really appealing other stories in it i think are are a little bit more grounded or a little bit more traditionally structured things like uh the mahi mahi chronicle or um to a certain degree i think like the case of seeing where I mean, the case of seeing feels like a procedural detective story, except for it has a paranormal element, but still has that lyrical sense of, of dialogue and, and pacing and flow that seems unique to how you write. I, I mean, I know that you write longer fiction and that you've also done graphic fiction and a number of other different things. What was the draw for you to short story? I mean, you've been talking about kind of that sense of not necessarily having to have a definitive start and end point, but, you know, just telling what the story needs to be. So I'm wondering what for you, what brought you into the format like that? What brings you back to it? What challenges it presents you? Um, what advantages are there? What, you know, what is it about short story that really, really appeals to you? I think I've always been a short story writer. It's my comfort. It's my sweet spot. 
when I write a short story, I feel quite at home, particularly because it works with my approach to writing. I'm a very, how can I put this? I write on a trigger. I am not a structured writer, especially when I write short stories. It would bore me very quickly if I knew where the story was going. And so normally I would start with an idea. I know that I want to write about a boy in the village and I want to write about uh, a darkness in him, but I don't really know what the darkness is going to do and where it's going to take him. And so I just begin writing straight from my head. And in a way, the stories write themselves because I really immerse myself into it. I, I get absolutely absorbed into the story. I become the story. I become the character. I laugh. I cry. I, you know, everything about them. And I think this is what happens with the writing. And that's why the stories sort of shape themselves and they warp and they weave and, and it comes out into something that surprises me, astonishes me. And, and that's what I enjoy. I was quite intrigued hearing you say a Mahi Mahi Chronicle because that's almost like a Spanish way of saying it. It's actually a Maji, Maji Chronicle. So Maji in Swahili means water. And the story is about, having read the story, it's about this wizard or magician who gives the African people a portion where they believe that the white man's bullets will turn into water and that's why it's called the Magi Magi Chronicle and it's another story that I, I'm very close to it mostly because of the themes in it and, and just the learnings that come out of it. I really, really like that one. I thought that one was interesting because there is such a, a juxtaposition of the darkness of the world that is forming in that one. As this wizard, I, I think his name is Zor. Am I saying it right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, his son's name is Pickle, um, which it, which is great. It, it's it's the thing that's so funny about that because the ramifications of their actions go to some very, very dark places. And yet there is a whimsy and fun to the dialogue between father and son. Just the, the fact that his kid's name is Pickle, the fact that like they're kind of bickering with each other all the time. I like that feel where you're exploring where a little bit of change of events, a little bit of giving somebody power and then, you know, seeing how the thirst for power tends to be never ending. And there's a bit of a twist to that that story too that I, I like a lot. It's very fun. It's one of my favorite stories because I, I think most of my stories actually do have a theme. I hadn't realized what the theme is, but when I look at all the stories, irrespective of what I'm writing about, there's always a relationship component, which means that in this story, it's about the relationship that the magician has with his son and also his relationship with the village and the people that they visit. And all of my stories, I think there's always that, that I think how people relate to each other. And I think it says something about me because I'm a creature who, uh, I have a deep affection for people. I'm very curious about people. I watch people, I see how they interact with each other. When I go to a restaurant, I, I you know, I look at them and wonder, are these lovers, are these ones fighting? the relationship between the mother and the child. And so that relationship aspect is always there. But what I also like about the short story is that it has a certain self-sufficiency. A short story doesn't have to finish. You can leave it in a place that leaves the reader thinking about it. And there's also a lightness to it. And also you need to have a certain restraint in the writing. People tend to think that a short story is easier to write than a novel. Not really, because in the story, you have just very little space with which to build a robust character and not to get carried away with the setting and the scenery, to bring everything very sharply and swiftly, but in a way that moves the reader for that moment in time. Yeah. I like that you address that because that is something I we talk about a lot on this show, which is like world building, which is, you know, setting up the atmosphere, detailing out how a world works. I think with short fiction, one of the appeals to it for me as a reader is that you don't have to be too worried about the rules or how much the sense of things holds together. The concept is first and foremost, and then how that's played out. I think a lot of times the things that work in short stories break if you pull them out into longer pieces because you you know strain the credibility of those ideas. But in the short fiction, they can work because you're in and out of it. I'm curious for you when it comes to setting up these worlds and these spaces, I mean, in approaching some of these, they might feel like our world for a minute, but then over the course of just some dialogue or a little bit of revelation in the story, we'll quickly learn that, no, there are 
you know, basically God's on the earth or the mythology is alive here, or this is a science fiction story. And then you have to kind of allow the reader to embrace that sense of the world while the story goes along in a fairly brief uh, format. Uh, So how do you approach that? How do you make that world building real for the reader in such a short period of time, knowing that uh, you will exit out before it has to over explain itself, but at the same time that it needs to hold together cohesively enough that they have a context for the story that they're experiencing? Yeah, that's a really good question. It comes down to one, the fact that immersive experience that I talked about, I I feel things very deeply and it makes it easy to write a story, especially when I feel it. And so I find sometimes commission stories are very difficult because the idea doesn't hit me immediately. I don't feel it. And sometimes I have to let it linger for a while until it starts pulling at me, pushing at me. And I, I really feel that it wants to come out and it wants to write itself. And I do research, like research is really important. When I did the PhD in writing, it taught me how to do research. And what it means is that the concept is clear in your mind, but you don't have to write it all. The research is really for you because it guides some of the directions of the characters and it guides some of the events and it guides the setting. Google is my friend. You can find out so much from Google. Like when you Google a disease, you Google a planet. So I know as part of the skeleton, when I know that I'm going to write a story, I know that maybe I want to interrogate a disease. And so maybe I do research about AIDS, or I want to interrogate a planet or a galaxy. And so I know at the back of my mind, I know what are the things within that planet or within that galaxy what my curiosity is. And so uh, if I want to write about an event that happens in a garden, I take a walk because for the short story to be really immersive and for it to be really authentic, you have to have that specificity, which means that you're being specific without being boring. And so what the flower looks like, what it smells like, I could say that I'm cooking dinner, but I could break it down and really get into the integral elements of that dinner, you know, lighting the stove and, and you know, how the flames look like, the dance of the flames. I think I love metaphor and I love imagery and I love rhythm. When I read my story, once I write it, I actually read it across different media. I could read it as a PDF. I could read it in the printed form. I could read it out loud. I speak the dialogue because the rhythm is so important. I like the melody of words. I explore. I'm curious about things and and that's what comes into the story. So because I'm immersed into the story, first and foremost, I am the writer, but I'm also the story's first reader. And so it reaches a point where I know this is where I need to pull out and this is where things need to to tie each other you know properly but also I never quite know when a story is finished because sometimes it keeps coming at me I think it's finished and I've put the end and I put it away and I wake up you know at, at midnight with an idea and so it's also about layering once I write the first draft and I'm happy with it and then I begin layering it with ideas that keep jumping at me until it stops. So I sort of know a story is finished when my head is calm. I'm at peace. The ideas stop jumping at me then. I like that you address that because that's something it was definitely in my notes to talk about, which is just in a short story is figuring out when to exit. With longer form works, with novels, you know, knowing the end or thinking about how things are going to wrap up is very, very important. With a short story, you are working in a smaller amount of space and picking your moments is very, very important. When I think about some of the pieces in this story, there are some stories like a nursery rhyme where I feel like it ends right where it absolutely makes sense, where, you know, there's a revelation and there is a choice and there is a consequence and the story is finite. And you can clearly let it dance in your head afterwards and think about what those choices will cost, but it it lands and it's done. Versus for me, like the story, The One Who Sees, which is about a young boy who um, is going to boarding school and is dealing with this sort of transition from living kind of out in a small like village community to being in a city to prepping for this different world. And he has this uh, sort of like animal spirit nature that he recognizes in other people. He has this friend who is completely alien to the civilized world and is magical in kind of her own way. 
way that story i could have read an entire novel of that story i loved the characters in it i really really enjoyed it and so when it was done I had that moment of being like, I get where why this ends here, but I didn't want it to end. And so I was almost a little frustrated. But at the same time, I understood you know, how that worked. So in, in a story like that, or for instance, a case of seeing where you could have gone several steps further um, to a resolution of that story in a more traditional format in the way that you would think about like with like a procedural or something, but you don't. The solving of the of the mystery is not as central as the solving of the character's own understanding of self and and her emotional state and, and the baggage she's carrying, I think. For stories like that, is that something where you had to really work to find that landing point? Was that something you worked with an editor to make sure that you had it kind of correct? What does that look like for you in the review? vision process and and in development? I think it just comes down to the gut feel. Sometimes it just feels that this is the right place, this is the resolution, or sometimes it comes through the layering where you add a little bit to it because you feel it needs to go somewhere to, to find some closure. If I were to write a bigger story out of one of my short stories, A Case of Seeing is actually one that I would expand into a a bigger story because I really love the detective. I connected very much with her and I I could feel her. And she's um, a character that I would love to explore and sort of either to expand the story. Let me explain how I write a a bigger piece, like a novel or a novella, because I am intrinsically a short story writer. And so for me to write a bigger piece, it's almost like I write it story by story. I hide little stories within the bigger piece where a chapter of a novel could actually be a short story in its own right. Or within a chapter, there may be mini stories still around either the character or a relationship or an event. And then I layer them in such a way that it becomes an interconnection that becomes the sum of the whole. And so you need to do it very craftily in such a way that somebody reading it doesn't see that there are actually hidden little stories within that piece. And that's how it works for me. I write my big pieces story by story. And so the fact that a case of seeing is a standalone in its own, that's perfect because that could be maybe part one of the book. And then I could continue into another part where I develop it and develop it and and put the, you know, weave the stories in such a way that they make sense, but they go somewhere. I'm also, uh, and I feel like I'm circling back a little bit on this, but um, when you're talking about like, the genesis of stories, I think you would fall into kind of what we think of as a discovery writer, you know, jumping into an idea and just running with it to see where it goes. There are some stories that I look at and I feel like I can see the point, and, I, and, and this is just my own observation of it, but I feel like I can see the point where you were discovering and then it took a twist and then you followed that path into a different, into maybe not the most obvious story branch. And I could be wrong about this, but um, for me... The best example of that is this the story being Marcus, which is I hate spoiling anything on the show. And I feel like like getting to know what this this who this character is, is kind of a spoiler in the story. But I will say is that what we start off seeing is a kind of bored physical trainer who's fairly disinterested in the people who are coming in to sign up for his classes and their sort of immediate infatuation with him. We discover that this is actually an immortal person who has been around for a really long time and is just sort of biding his time between relationships, heartbreaks and loneliness. I felt like for two pages of this, I was just reading, you know, a bit of a slice of life for somebody who worked in one of these spaces. And then he makes a mention of something that feels metaphorical. And then that metaphor branches out into his reality and explains his actual history. And so I was curious with a story like that, did that story start from, oh, I want to write about a character who is immortal and does this? Or did it start from a scene that developed out and then you found where it was going? I absolutely knew with being Marcus that I wanted to write an alternate history story. I've always been fascinated with Roman history and I wanted to take it there. And it took me a while to try to find who did I want to write an alternate history for and and what will happen with them. I didn't know how the story would go, but I did start it knowing that it's going to begin with somebody on earth, but then they're going to, they're reliving their history. And so it's building that history, but in such a way that it's part of the story without being like you're reading history. Yeah. yeah, I have written other alternate history stories. There's one in which I write about Idi Amin because I am originally from Tanzania. 
and I friends from Uganda, neighbors from Uganda, and it was really close and personal to me. And I was always curious to write something like that. Yeah, I didn't need to do too much research about it. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> when it's close to heart, yeah. There's a number of places in this where, with like being Marcus, there is this connection to ancient Rome. There's a few different stories that mention what, why, how stories, which is uh, a, a bit of phrasing that I wasn't familiar with, and I don't know where particularly that comes from as far as like a, you know, like a cultural reference. But I did think I recognized the structure of the stories. I just had never heard it, you know, phrased that way. There is uh, one story, a nursery rhyme, which is the characters' names are very specific. I mean, there is Magellan and Triton and Venus, and it all feels like it's making reference to, you know, like Greek mythology. And there's, uh, you know, there's this Ganymede character this um, in, in it as well. And I feel like there's a lot of layers of subtext going on there. And I felt like I was grabbing onto some of them and kind of like losing grip on some of them as well. And I think in the end, it didn't matter for me if I recognized what there might have been a referential for because the story works on its own. But something that comes up a lot on this show is an exploration of for people who are writing science fiction and fantasy, we're often constructing stories on top of things that people already have some kind of foundation for. You know, if they're if we're talking about science fiction, they understand what spaceships are. They understand what aliens are. They know what teleportation is, things like that. If we're talking about fantasy, they get the basic sword and sorcery tropes that might inhabit a lot of the very you know Western style fantasy. So we're building on things that people already know about. When you're writing short stories like this, particularly ones that are layered with metaphor, that are layered maybe with with certain types of referentialism, how much are you thinking about what the audience is going to come in and understand about it? How much of it do you feel like you need to explain to them? Or is it maybe an opportunity to them for to them to, you know, run off on their own, do a little research, to maybe get you know inter- interested in it and explore? I mean, what's your approach to that? I am a very selfish writer because basically I write a story first for myself. The story is a curiosity or um, exploring a question to which I am looking for answers. And along the way, the question might divert into something different. And then, and, and that's why some stories change and shift as they go, because it, it's now a different curiosity and I'm exploring it until I reach a place where I know this is probably where to stop or maybe it becomes another question. And I'm also being African and being Australian. I hadn't realized this, but a lot of me goes into the story. And so, for example, when you talk about naming in the African tradition, naming is very important. If I tell you my name is Kurwa, already you know that I am one of twins and that I was born first because as the elder twin, my name is Kurwa and the other twin is Dotto. If I'm called Bahati, it means good luck, which probably means my mother really tried hard to get me. And finally, when she got me, she called me good luck or something happened. Or if my name is Shida, maybe my parents were going through a really stressful time. And so, you know, Shida means difficulty or trouble. And so the naming of my characters, that is the one thing that I really put effort into. Although my stories tend to be unstructured, except when I'm writing a longer piece, where I actually look at the structure, where almost part by part at a skeletal level. But with a short story, I look for the name. I research for the name because it's important for me to see what that name identifies. And so even the secondary characters, well, um, if I have a character named John, uh, and you'll rarely find a John or a Mary or a Jane in, in my writing because the name has to have that significance. And so that part of me goes into the story. And then going back to the one who sees... I think it speaks also to me in the sense that it speaks to my dichotomy. I am a sum of many. I have cultural diversities. Even growing up in Africa, I didn't just live in the village or live in the town or live in the city, and they're very distinct. So where my grandmother grew up was in a village on an island, and she grew up in a very traditional sense where it was a very patriarchal society where, you know, the man had a big say, and there are actually certain foods that my grandmother wasn't allowed to eat. And so she never drank milk. She never ate meat. She never ate certain kinds of fish because those were for the men. And even oh, wow. after it became, I know, even after it became permissible in society, she still couldn't bring herself to do it. 
but my mother was a deviant and so my mother ate everything. When I went to the UK, because I lived in the UK for a while, and also when I came to Australia, you'd be astonished at the things that I buy at the supermarket. I buy chicken gizzards, and they're not for a dog or a cat, they're for me. Because back home, a chick- I know, chicken gizzards are for men. Girls are not allowed to eat them. And so it's almost like a novelty. I have a whole packet of chicken gizzards for me. So that tradition weaves into my story. And so in the one one who sees, you can see the experience of the boy in the village and his experience in the town and his experience in the city and the questions that he's asking. The, he's navigating his relationship with Keledi in the village and his grandmother. He has that curiosity. And also, you know, how he experiences the city and how he sees the relationship between his parents. And so the relationship comes in. So I, I, I do steal myself and my friends and other people into my stories. But there'll always be a disclaimer that it's a work of fiction. Yeah. <laughs> I, I really uh, I related to the one who sees in a lot of ways because I, I tend to relate to stories of disconnection. Having been a kid who felt out of place a lot of times, who got brought from one side of the country to another, to a very different you know environment, and then trying to figure out how to fit in and never feeling like I fit in in a lot of ways. And this brings up another thing I wanted to address about like point of view. A number of your stories in here use a second person where they they're referencing that basically the narrator is speaking to the reader as if they are the character in the story. I think uh, the one who sees is one of those stories where it's basically referencing you as the boy in it, which makes you almost like an avatar for the, the character in a lot of ways. And that spoke to me in a lot of ways in that story. That's not the type of POV we would encounter very much in longer form works. I think it would be really hard to make it work long form. Uh, works very well in, in short story, but it can also, I think, be startling to readers who are unused to encountering that. There's also first person, there's also, you know, third person omniscient and and limited and things in, in all these different stories. There's a lot of different kinds of perspectives. But in particular, that second person, what was the draw for that for you? And how difficult is it to get that right so that that speaks correctly to the reader, whether you as the first reader or the ones who come later? I find myself very comfortable with the second person. I I love the first person and the third person as well. And sometimes it's really just about the feel. And the one who sees when I originally wrote it, it was in third person. And then I, I wanted it to be different. I just wanted something to make it unique in a way. And I know it's always a risk because not many readers love you stories. They're very direct addressing them and they can make them very uncomfortable and some editors don't like you stories either but when I wrote it in third person it just felt like it it needed something more and for me that was changing the perspective putting into a you story and I have written quite a number of you stories I have a collection coming out in November which hasn't been announced yet so I'll try not to say too much about it but it does have you stories in it and they work really well and so far the people who, who've read it have been able to find immersion into it and I, I, I can't explain why it works and I don't have to go through it like um, change it too much I, there are stories where I've actually started the writing as a you story without having to change the tense. Then with a the first person perspective, it depends on the topic. For example, you have some taboo topics like rape or something like that. And when you write it in the first person, it can be very confronting. Or if you're writing a murder, say from the perspective of the murderer or the perspective of the victim, you really have to wait and see how what perspective might work better for the this story and that's I think that's how I wait I I take a lot of risks in my writing and with speculative fiction you can get away with a lot of things I've mentioned this that obviously there's there's a flair for language in all of this but um, but there's a very distinct sense uh, to the dialogue as well like I mentioned earlier I mean I feel like it a lot of times it feels I, and theatrical is not the right word because I think that implies the wrong thing, but it feels like when I read a play, when I think about how plays tend to use an economy of words in their dialogue to say what they mean to say, but layer it with subtext, and that sometimes it will feel like almost there's like a sentence missing in between that is being heard but not spoken, if that makes sense. I'm curious as far as when you're constructing the dialogue, again, it sounds like you, you're very much a writer that goes by feel and these words flow from you in this particular way. 
how much work is it to get that dialogue correct? Is there places where like uh, from editorial or, or, or beta readers or things like that, where they're like, you know, I'm, I'm connecting to this, but maybe I'm not hearing this right. Or am I missing something here? Obviously a lot of these stories benefit from the, from second and third readings um, because there is a lot of layers, but you know, what is that approach for dialogue for you and getting that to sound right on the page? The dialogue is really important. I, I teach writing and one of the things that I really emphasize is the dialogue because your dialogue needs to be authentic and I listen to people. When I, uh, I was talking about how I observe people in a restaurant or if I'm sitting on a tram, I actually listen to how people talk because people don't talk in perfectly good sentences. They don't say, how are you? I am fine, thank you. It's like we, we speak to advance an agenda. You could say, hey, uh, how are you going, mate? And I'd say, that's stupid down the road because that's the first thing in my mind and so with dialogue it's part of the immersive experience I feel it I have to put myself into that character and especially when I'm writing something that is emotive whether it's an interaction between lovers those are the easiest because I really feel it or if it's a rage I can feel the anger and just the response like how would somebody angry actually say this they wouldn't never finish sentences it's just how we talk and the secret to my dialogue is I just listen and I, I love writers who work on dialogue. There's an Australian author who unfortunately has passed away. His name is Peter Temple. And if you read his books, he's a crime fiction writer, but he's also a literary fiction writer. And his dialogue is sharp as a knife. It takes you places. You read it and you're mesmerized. And I think that's what I try to do with my writing. I try to mesmerize myself. I've never read a story that I've written and, and felt bored with it because it puts me right back to that feeling that I had when I was writing it, that rage or that affection or that deep sadness or that torment. And uh, I, I get very immersed and I think that helps in my dialogue. But the editorial process also helps because somebody might say, maybe this sounds better this way and they make they might flip something or they might say, uh, maybe um, let's crop this or let's say it in a way that your audience will understand because it's clear in your head, but let's try to, to say it differently. So that helps too. I, I, editors mean a lot to me, but you need to have the right editor. And I have been fortunate to have editors who understand my writing. I like that you mentioned this, that sense that, you know, people don't speak in, you know, in, in full sentences, they trail off, they change mid-direction. I mean, I'm a person who hosts a podcast and a video show, and and that's a thing. Even from an editing perspective, sometimes is trying to connect the dots between uh, you know ideas that trail off, and I do it all the time. It's one of the things that I've recognized over the course of pandemic and being home all the time with my wife is that uh, there's a sh certain shorthand that I speak in with her, where there's a lot of times where there are sentences I don't complete because I just get to the section where I know she knows what I'm talking about, and I'll say, and so, and then I just stop or go on to the next thing. <laughs> and I'm worried that I'm going to go back out into public and and be unable to finish my thoughts because I've been so used to just talking with her where she knows what I'm talking about. I don't need to belabor the, you know, the concept because, you know, she knows where it's going. But yeah, in a naturalistic dialogue and try to capture that, people do speak in, in ways that we're not conditioned to being used to if we watch a lot of TV or movies or whatever, where the, it's a little bit more on the nose or, um, you know, less digressions and things like that. Overall, creative process, we've talked a lot about just like how you get in and do this stuff. I'm curious what your tools of the trade are. What do you what do you write in? I write in anything. I, I write in my head. I, I scribble on my text on my mobile phone. I email things to myself. It's almost like I write across the whole day. I don't really have a routine where I could say I write 500 words a day in the morning, mostly because I write on a trigger. And so you never know when I, an idea is going to hit. And so by my bedside, I have a notepad where if I wake up in the middle of the night with an idea or a dream that I really must write it or I'm not going to sleep, I scribble it. Or I could, you know, jot something on my phone. I also, uh, I write very basically, I, I just have my laptop and, you know, very simple. I, I don't have anything, it, just the laptop and Google in my head. And then I observe, there's so many stories in the world. I could just be watching the news and this story just hits me. I could be talking to somebody that every day has so much speculation in it. You could write so much. Yeah. 
I was going to say, I think when I write, still that African and Australian in me, that blend is there. And it surprises me how much Aussie I am and also how much African I am. Because when I talk to my family, they say I speak Swahili like it's English. And when I talk English, they say you speak English as if it's Swahili. So I'm sort of like an in-between and so some of my thoughts are almost like a direct translation, probably from Swahili to English. But I dream in English and I think in English. It's um, I, I might say it differently because I taught myself to read English. I also like what you said about the, the fact that the world is teeming with stories if you pay attention. Because if you go to any conference anywhere and do a panel and open up a Q&A, one of the questions I think almost every writer gets eventually is somebody goes, well, where do you get your ideas? Like, well, the ideas are everywhere. If you just quiet your mind for a little bit and watch everything else around you, there's an endless font uh, for story. And particularly if you allow your mind to be nonlinear enough to draw interesting connections, you can find endless things to, to create tales around if you just take a moment to stop and listen and pay attention to the people and environments. So I like that you brought that up a lot. We've only talked about like, you know, five stories out of this you know, 20 story collection. Um, there's a lot to chew on in here. I will say that I think that if people pick this up and explore this story, I suggest that they read a story at a time, not try to sit down and just read the volume on its own. I think that each one is worth picking up, exploring uh, in a bite-sized format, walking away from it, thinking about it. I know that I was reading it uh, sometimes in bed and I would read like a story a night and occasionally in just exhaustion and being up too late, I would kind of drift off and start the, the, the surreality of the story would blend into the surreality of my mind. And then I would kind of come to and I would have a moment where I wasn't sure if I was still reading or if I was dreaming. And I I thought that worked. I thought that that made sense within the confines. Not every story is like that, but certainly some of them have that kind of feel where they they become untethered in a really interesting way. And I felt like it made it possible for my brain to go some different places. There's a question I ask people a lot, uh, which is that I ask them what stories and books and writers that they read that fuel their story engine. And I was struck by the fact that while I was reading this book, that I started thinking about my own short stories. I started thinking about things I hadn't written or, you know, that I basically put in a, in a drawer, you know, five or six years ago and hadn't touched for a while. And suddenly I'm doing the dishes and those things are springing back to mind. And I always think that's a sign of a great writer because I find that when somebody has a unique uh, voice and a unique vision and imagination, for me anyway, it's not just that. I enjoy what they do, but I feel like it fuels my own brain. It turns on the story engine in my own mind. And The Road to Whoop Whoop did that for me, uh, where I felt like suddenly there's things banging around in my head that I hadn't listened to in a long time. And they're wholly unrelated to the stories in here. It's just something about the way you write that opened up my mind in that way and that I really enjoyed. So... Uh, like I said, this book is out now from uh, from Meerkat Press. I'll stick it up here in the the uh, the, the screen <laughs> back here from it again um, with that beautiful cover. Um, so people can go out and get that now. It's worth noting. There's also um, you have you have some other things out. You have uh, uh, Ivory Story. If I can get that in here, you've got a uh, a collection called Black Moon that has uh, like graphic speculative fiction, so these sort of bite sized um, like short stories. Um, with uh, with illustrations and stuff in it. Um, so there is a lot of uh, of other material for people that they can jump into. Um, oh, yeah. And Dominion. Um, yes. what, tell us a little bit about that, about that stuff. And then tell us where people can find you online so they can follow your work. Yes. Yeah, so Dominion is a really powerful collection of African centric stories. And so if you haven't read Black Writing and you'd really want to see what it feels like i'd invite you to read dominion and just read it with an open mind just be open to the experience and to to find it as an immersive experience london centric is one in which i have a story and i was really thrilled to be invited it's by new compress and it's really about tales of a future london and so it's Part of, it's part of the what if of story writing. You can find me on my website at eugenebacon.com. I'm on Twitter at Eugene Bacon, and you're welcome to connect with me anytime. Well, awesome. Well, this has been a pleasure to talk to you on the show. I hope people go check this out. I think this is the kind of fiction that maybe 
not every sci-fi and fantasy reader necessarily finds in their their hands all the time, but I think it is very worthy for them to explore new formats, be open to a completely different type of story style than maybe that they read on a regular basis. And I I think there's a little something for every fan of speculative fiction in here. And I really appreciate you joining me on Fictitious. Thank you so much, Edron. This is quite a pleasure. 